Before we go any further, let me just say there are many, many good ways, legitimate ways to build a tail. This was an I-beam tail that I made. Obviously, foam tails have been around for a long time. We have the nobler type tail where it's built with a lot of little ribs and sticks and edges and then silk spanned. Even some of these tails which have been flat or airfoiled, I've made them both ways. I've not found a significant difference in having an airfoiled or a flat tail. I was hoping to have a Nomex carbon tail on this plane. We never got the Nomex in time, so we're going to go ahead and make the wooden tail. basically use a method very similar to or an exact copy of I'm not sure yet the way Paul Walker holds his tail and he's used flat tails for years this won't be a whole lot different so it would be adaptable to uh, a traditional stunner as well as Miss Ashley Bay Fitzgerald most famous for a uh, nice article he had in stunt news but again geodetic rib layout Basically a built up tail. It's funny in this photo, and this is the Walker Flyo photo from, I don't know, last year or two years ago. A foam tail, a built up tail, a flat tail, an airfoil tail, Billy Warwood's a triangle tail, <laughs> and a Spitfire, a flat sheet tail. So basically you have, the idea here is that almost all of these can be made to work. First thing I always do when I make one of these tails up, I have this old jig. And there's two ways to do this. You can see what this is, just scrap ball. So I take a 3 8 rod, similar to this, wet a piece of balsa and just shove it in here and it makes a U-shaped piece of balsa. That, that's one easy way to do it. The other way is, and I always use this to store the piece except right now we're a little behind the curve and we want to get busy. I, I took out two extra pieces. The other way is, and this is, there's no point even putting this on a video, we've done so much molding, is we've just taken a piece of 3 8 rod, put it in front of a piece of 3 8 wood, and in essence just wrapped a piece of wood around it. Now the reason for this is we're going to need a leading edge, a wrapped leading edge piece to make this tail the way I'd like. Again, if we had the Nomex, just didn't happen, but doesn't hold us back from possibly in the future. Having, we wanted to have an airfoil tail, well, that didn't happen either. We're, we're kind of getting down to the point where flying season's gonna be here soon. We wanna allow a couple of weeks for the finish, and we certainly wanna get out to the flying field soon. You know, what happens is you get cabin fever. I haven't been flying in six months. You get cabin fever, but anyway, you can take the bandage off, and I know this sounds a little bit redundant, but I wanted to show this because this is such an easy way to make a wrap. No matter what half-inch tail you're going to use, you can use this. It's a way of not having to carve. Remember that thing of, that we love is not having to do that work. This is the best trick. We've got a tape on doing a geodetic tail. This one is going to be a straight rib tail. Basically, just pull a piece off. And that now becomes our leading edge. You can see what we'll do in the meantime is we can store it right in here if we want. Now, because it's the end of this session, we're going to come back tomorrow. But just by storing it, I wanted to show this. By storing it in here, wrapped up like that, Tomorrow when we come down, that'll be ready to use. Thinking, yeah, boy, that's pretty tough. You only need one piece. Well, you know what the reality is? I always make up a spare piece. 
wet up a piece of 16th. I'll do this off camera, but actually I ought to make up more than one. We'll make up one spare piece just in case. You never know when one of these pieces is going to be uh, some, <laughs> you know, it can happen. But anyway, if you see how nice that bends around our little mandrel here, just wrap that with the bandage a la Al Rabe. And I like to make, first thing is have the leading ed edge pieces in stock and ready when I'm ready to go. And tomorrow we'll be ready to start this. This is such an easy way to make a tail. It's, it goes very quickly. Okay, you can use soapy water. You can use just plain hot water. You can use soapy ammonia, sudsy ammonia. Ace bandage, Al Rabe uses just an old bed sheet torn up. You don't even need to buy a, you don't need a lot of expensive tools to do this, that's for sure. And a little thing with scrap wood to store it in if you're gonna make it up ahead of time. In this case, one pin in here. Put this aside to dry. We don't even need the extra bandage. Put this aside to dry. When we come back tomorrow, we're ready to build a tail. Famous last words. Okay, today we got all our sea grain, four inch wide, 16th inch wood out, our spare leading edge, and what was what amounts to be our hopefully good leading edge, and we're ready to start laying out the tail. Before I ever even start a tail, get all a little grit all the little things with a brand new blade and a scraper because I'm going to be using the flat of the table to actually make the tail. Now you obviously need, especially for a flat tail, you need something flat, a piece of glass, a piece of marble. Wood is really not the straightest thing in the world, but I guess in a pinch it would have to do. More times I've started a tail or started a wing or something and right in the middle of it I flip it over and there's a little thing of glue on a table and I have to make sure the part of the table that I'm going to use is perfectly flat. Look at this, even after all of this I find a little spot out here. There's as many times as I've said, ah, that's not really important yet. The most important thing, start with a nice clean flat area. First thing we're going to start with is we have an outline drawing of what we want the tail to be. Again, it's a flat tail. What I need to take into account, I may as well make the change right now, because this part of the fuselage is going to be flat. I need to figure out this dimension, and that's the fuselage width, because this piece will be flat up here. It won't on a on a glue together plane. It would come to a point on a take apart plane. You need to have a little well, in essence, a little flat spot up there. We're going to have, there's two features of this tail that I like. Now, of course, we you could lay out the ribs geodetically. One of the downsides of that is you usually see the sheeting is kind of ripply. Well, we're going to lay all straight ribs an inch apart, roughly an inch apart anyway, maybe a little closer, I don't know. It's flat, so we can build it right flat on a table. There'll only be half inch little blocks on the tip. I want the tips to be as small as possible. But notice the elevators, like the flaps, are constant, constant. So every rib will be the same. Once I lay out a rib, you don't have to take into account that taper. And it's that taper that usually winds up making the elevator a pretzel. When you have a taper where it's bigger at one side than the other, you can't build it on a flat table. You have to jig this up. It's something that if you don't think it through, you can build automatically crooked flaps and elevators, and it's a constant problem. This eliminates the problem by having it constant, the whole piece. Every rib is the same, like a Vico Chief wing. Build a tail this way, one of the things you don't even need is a good plan. If you do it the way I'm showing, all you need really is the outline. If it's a take-apart plane, you need that little flat up there. You don't even need to mark out the ribs, and I'll show why. We're going to go get the sea grain wood, 16th sea grain wood, and we're going to lay out the stab in one piece. Now, the way this type of a tail gains its strength is there's no joint. The grain needs to go parallel to the trailing edge, and you need to have one piece. Now, another good choice for this, because we're going to have to put some screws in here to line this up once it's actually in place, 
I want to make the, the center of this as stiff as possible. I don't want to have the center, and I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to stiffen that up. But not having a joint in the middle usually means that you're not going to wind up with dihedral or anhedral. And if you use all straight C grain wood, this should be almost flex free. And that combined with that carbon fiber on the body. Or let's say you're doing a nobler tailor and you, you could replace a nobler, a sweeper, an SV11, an impact. Well, impact already has it. I think even Ted Fancher's plans show a half inch tail. They've experimented with that. And it's worth it to do it for yourself because I haven't found a difference between, that's the first question people want to know, is the built up tail better or is this a foam tail? Or, build it yourself and see. In this case, one of the choices, we have, if this tail doesn't work out the way we want, we can just make another one. We can make, if it's too heavy, we can make, we can cut out some of the wood, we can take some of the finish off. But what we're really gonna try to, well, hopefully have soon is the Nomex and we'll be able to make a much stiffer, more rigid tail. But in the meantime, this is going to get us through. It'll only take a day or two to put this together, get a finish on it. This, this should go together relatively quickly, and this is a really good way to make a tail, in my opinion. Leading edge parts that we've molded. So the, but the first thing we need to do is we don't want to have this piece any bigger than it has to be, because the grain is going in, in a not the best direction. We want as much of the tail, in other words, Here's, here's a point. If I laid this out and you made the leading edges this thick, the grain is not going in the direction we want. We want as much of the grain to go, or as much of the wood, to have the grain going tip to tip. And that's what, that's what adds a lot of rigidity to this system. And having these light leading edges, these are easy to make. They're a snap. You can make extra ones. You don't even need a mold. I just taped that piece of rod right to a piece of 3 8 have this real nice jig that this laid in and you just pressed it in and it was it was like a u-shaped piece of ball so wouldn't you just trim this off well you know what i looked in the closet somebody borrowed the jig and didn't give it back so the first thing i'm going to have to do is i can lay this out with masking tape just carefully lay out so that the whole leading edge has a very even parting line now it isn't real critical and i don't need to make it any bigger than this but i sure wouldn't want to make it right in the curve i want to have a little bit of extra material because we're going to have a joint that we want to bury, we want to sand out that you can't see it. But now what I want to do, I want to go around this piece, if possible, just do this. Whoops, I'm measuring that end. Tough to do just looking through the camera, measure this end. Get a piece of tape on this side and then I know I can make those cuts. Now this may seem one of the things I really truly believe in is never make it any more complicated than it's hard enough the way it's supposed to be. You don't need to invent ways of making it harder. If you're, if you're like me and your eyes are not really crisp, crisp, what a wonderful word. Anyway, I like to just on the edge of the tape and I use a ruler. Just lay out a rough line so I know. Now, obviously, we'll get a brand new XL blade in there. But now we should have a good chance of cutting a leading edge piece that's molded. All the grain is going in the proper direction. And it should be relatively, if we don't do something uh, to, to destroy it, relatively warp free. Now, I also have on that geodetic tail that I made. There's a couple other little tricks, but one of the other things I didn't like about the geodetic ribs is in the front, it leaves too much of a bow and in my case, I launched the plane with a stooge. I want to have the leading edge up near the body relatively solid. And what I'll do is harden the wood inside with CA, maybe even put a little piece of carbon fiber in there or something, something to make it a little stiffer. But if you were launching a plane with a tail wheel, obviously you could leave that step out. This is time for a new blade. Boy, I can remember when I was younger and didn't need glasses for everything. Holy mackerel, this would have been a snap. Now I need to look and pretty soon my nose is going to be hitting the wood. Anyway, problem is we're all getting older. And we're all getting older together. You think we would have a little more sympathy for each other. Okay, that takes care of one side. Obviously, the other side, pretty redundant. Just cut the other one off. Then we'll get out a sanding block and true that up. And then we'll replicate it and we'll have our two leading edges. A good idea to trim these up just a little bit oversized before we tree them up. Just easier to do it this way. 
Again, this tail like this goes together so quickly. And if you've ever built tails with triple and double taper and angles and uh, it's a lot of time. I have a piece of sandpaper sticky back glued to the table. This will just give us a, a relatively straight edge to work off. I'll go down. It isn't real important that it's in any that this is any special thickness. I just don't want it either too short or too too long. Now once I see I've got a nice flat on this, then that gets this piece ready. Now imagine if you try to carve this, believe me, have fun. <laughs> now I just want to put a light sanding on this. I don't want to change the shape. Just so it lays flat when I lay it down on the flat glass. There isn't a lot to do here. I pull it in the sanding isn't even right, just the deep buzzing. The next thing I have to do is lay out the wing saddle, where that's going to lay in there. Now, if it's a glue-in a glue -in plane, obviously less important, but you'd still want to know where it's going to rest on the fuselage because you want to have a rib right where it's going to rest. No matter how you do it, you want a rib right there. Just like you always want a rib right on the fu where the fuselage side goes through the wing, you want a rib right there. Taking some real careful measurements of this and I want to transpose that onto the plan. Again, on a glue together plane, you could just make it come to a point and bury the point inside the body. I guess you could do that too, but you'd have to hollow that out. I don't want to trade away any, any strength up there. So what I'm obviously going to want to do is right on this line have a rib. Right on this line and probably a double thickness rib relative to where the other ribs are. And this is on an angle. The other ribs will be straight. So this is a critical... I want to make that as accurate as possible. And obviously one of the things that's real easy to do is just lay this out and see if we're... Yeah, that should be... that should be relatively... relatively accurate. Roughly lay out based on this piece of wood where the leading edge is going to end. Because the way I build a tail I don't even need the plan at the end of this point. I'm just laying out the plan so I can see, get the dimensions, and then transpose them onto the bottom sheet of wood. And I can follow these in with a ruler. This is going to be the leading edge. So now I know what size this sheeting here is going to be. And I can connect these dots. And obviously, you lay this out for whatever plane, whatever uh, spacing you think is going to be right. I need that flat part in the middle. But keep in mind one of the important things, I think the most important thing anyway, is to get that rib right underneath. In other words, where that rib is going to be, I don't want to have it out here or in here. I want it right on that, that point of stress. So this rib here now is going to be real important. This is going to be a double rib. The rest of the ribs are going to be 90 degrees to the trailing edge. So lay out, just to get a, a feel for where this is going to wind up, lay out the, the ribs roughly an inch apart. Of course, we can manipulate that as we go along. I want to lay this out. Now, all these ribs will be 90 degrees. So I can see right off the bat, this first one is going to intercept with this one. Well, I don't want that, so I want to bring that out until it intercepts right about there, which means... I probably want to go to the half inch mark. So what I can do then is leave an inch and a half out at the tip. See, I don't need to worry out at the tip. Nothing bad is going to happen out at the tip. And just work. This is how I want to lay this out. And of course, every tail would be different. Or you could shorten the distance between the ribs or whatever. This is just a a real basic way to do it. Okay, now I know that rib, which is the critical one. When I lay that out 90 degrees, that's going to give me a lot of strength right up in the part that's where the thing is being held by the stooge. And I can just leave this rib, this, just leave this last bay. In fact, it won't even matter. I'll just put an extra rib in there. Let it be a half inch. That won't be a problem at all. These tails usually come out so light. It's, 
there's nothing to it there's okay so now I've got those laid out now I need to get a 90 degree triangle now because these are going to be 90 degrees obviously a little triangle is in order now the reason I laid this out because I want to look at it and like this rib spacing thing I don't know if I want to just increase the rib I, there's a lot of tricky ways to do this to make it cute but in essence this is what I want to wind up doing is just looking at this and the key part of this the part that's really gonna matter is not out at the tip is this rib here because this one I'll make some end grain or double it up or something I haven't figured out exactly what I want to do yet and I don't really need this plan I could be doing this on the bottom sheet which is what I'm gonna ultimately do but right now I wanted to look at it in full scale before I cut wood. And it's always a good idea because a piece of paper is a real cheap alternative to cutting up all your four pound balsa wood. Just look at if I like that rib spacing. It's kind of easy after tracing in the edge of the elevator. I can pretty much lay this right on target. I laid out the leading edge as three eighth, trailing edge as an eighth and I can make the ribs interconnect so that if you see any of them showing through the final sheeting, not a real critical thing, but it would all, the ribs would line up. You can pretty much get the idea this is going to be a quarter inch trailing edge, a three eighth leading edge, an eighth inch, or wrapped piece. The ribs some heavy duty these two ribs here and possibly a center rib a little bit heavier duty than normal okay so I can look at this now in full scale and I can envision for instance the first thing I noticed is that I've made the horn that I previously made a little bit on a small side I don't want to take a chance that it's going to rub on a fuselage so I'll just replicate that horn off camera same as I made it originally I need a little bit wider horn I also now I can get out my best couple of pieces of sea grain sixteenth and start laying out the stab. Now that I have a plan I can look at. I want to go through our selection of sea grain wood, but notice these two on the end you wouldn't want to use them. So I want to get rid of any ones that look like they have a twist in them. And I'm I'm not real concerned with the weight. What I'm concerned with is the fact that they have a nice straight and that they are all sea grain. Most important thing, you don't want to use A grain on this. I want to have the ribs and I want to have the sheeting, the, especially the main sheeting. This is going to be the main sheeting. The straightest couple of pieces in here. With the straightest piece of four inch, you can you can pretty well see that I can lay this out and I need to add one little piece up here to make this base piece. Now I also look at the sea grain part of the wood and I want to make sure I have the best part of the wood. And you, you basically can just do this with your hand and feel where it's the most rigid. That's where it's the most, it's the grain is going to do you the most good. So the first thing is I need to make this sheet up in full scale and just go right in there and cut that little piece, curve that little piece in. And I know I can work right off the plan here and I can use the piece that's going to come off when I measure out at the tip. This piece that's going to come off out here I can probably wind up using for the middle so nothing will be wasted. I can just trace this line out. In fact what I'm going to do is bring the sheeting right up to the trailing edge and that'll save me one joint. I'll just need to make a 3 8 trailing edge and I can make this a little bit oversized. I'll leave the line on when I cut it. And that works, that little piece maybe just fit in the middle, I don't know. Just leave the line on so I have a little bit of extra material there to sand off, because I'm going to need to sand this to get a nice flat edge. Obviously this is going to attach right up in there. We always try to make these cuts with a new blade and with a cutting pad for the simple reason that what I in fact I want to move this up just a little bit what I'm trying to accomplish is 
to not to have to do a lot of dressing off to get a nice seam on this bottom piece. And if you follow through on this method step by step, you'll see that the tail goes together just... You'll wonder why people do it any other way, including me. <laughs> anyway, it is a good way. Okay, now we need to see That's the part I was waiting to see. And it's not critical, we have plenty of wood, but I just wanted to see if, for instance, you could get this out of one piece of wood. And if this will work out up here, it sure will. Wow. Okay, so now the next thing I'll do is I'll put a seam on here, and then just continue these lines up where we want them. Make these seams. I always try to use the biggest block possible. Try to hold the block at 90 degrees. And then when I press the two together, I can just put some masking tape to hold them together, just like laying up sheeting for a foam wing. Well, handy here, I have a piece of Teflon. You could use a piece of wax paper, of course, because Dave has been so generous in giving us this. I want to make sure that seam is nice and flat. Notice another thing, that I have the grain go. I don't want to use this angle. I'm using all the grain going tip to tip to tip to tip. Now, before I even do anything, I want to find, and just lightly, I'm trying to fill that little crack with dust is all I'm doing. Just let the dust sit in there. I'm not trying to remove material. Making these nice joints is, is a lot of people find this challenging. Keeping the glue tip open, I find that challenging. There we go. Now the dust that you've just laid in there kicks that off without making any popcorn already dry. Now all I want to do now is just dust this. I don't want to remove any material because I want to have a nice flat surface to work with. This is why I needed that plan to work with because I need to have these angles in full scale. Obviously, this is pretty easy to figure out right now. We can just continue this line up, and we know we need we know how much we need to take off the front. Once I have that angle, I can screw this up. Then I just can go over to the plans and mark off the little piece that needs to be cut off the front. Now I have my base sheet ready to go. The next thing I need to do is carefully mark off the rib stations and I can do that right from the plan. While you're going to do any kind of line layout is just tape this temporarily down. Tape it in the corners on the edges because this will hold it in place while we do the layout. And obviously you just continue all lines up forward and we'll be ready to attach the leading edge. Okay, I marked the center line. I marked, obviously just continue the lines up that we already created from the plans. And the next step, I'm gonna take the leading edges, make sure I have a good joint. I'll put the, the front piece in up here, I guess. Can lay that piece in, get my angles right and just lay in my secondary pieces and then we'll be ready to put ribs in. This piece is obviously will be very easy. We're just going to trace this right off. Try to hold a nice line.
Now after I dress this off, because I'm, I'm going to have to make some joints up there, I like to get a nice straight joint if possible. question of lining it up with the lines we've created. And once this dries, and I've got it, I'm over Teflon right now so that nothing's going to stick. Now I just need to figure out the miter joint once that moves. Okay. Now I can lay this piece in place. Get a rough idea about the miter joint. I can just lay them side by side, in fact. Okay, so I see I haven't got the angle just right. Now I can just block sand it in. Oh, I love that sound. To do is just get some tape, pull in this joint, put a little tension on it. And I'll flip it over and just run a bead of thin CA on it. And you can see how nice the tape holds that. Now I can just run that bead and make sure it's nice and level. Now the front, I need to kind of line up a little bit better than this. Just make sure that's even. You know, obviously, the, uh, the next step is just repeat this on the other side, and we'll be ready to lay in the ribs. The edges are on. I'm laying it on the flat table, making sure it's perfectly flat, and I want to sand this seam with a sanding block, and just let the dust fill in any little gaps that are in there. I don't want to have any high or low spots when I lay the ribs in. Now because I'm over Teflon, of course, then I can just run this glue seam from one edge right to the other. And this went together in a real short amount of time. In fact, we're ready for ribs. We're ready right now. I just need to trim these edges off. I'll get the zona, just trim the edges off, and this will be ready to go. Again, I always leave a little extra material on here. Oh, I love that sound. Now, because I always launch these planes, and most of the flying I do, I'm alone, the stooge grabs this right here. I want to harden that wood inside, even though you always, I accept the fact that I'll put a little bit of a ding in it. And the, the, the closer you space the ribs, obviously, the stiffer the tail becomes. 
So I'm ready now to lay this out. I need to cut up the ribs next. Lay this out on, well, we don't even need to plan now. We just need to lay this on a flat table, make sure it's flat as we tack in the ribs. And I'm, I'm always amazed whenever I make one of these how quick, usually the beginning of making any tail, a tail can take a long time, how quick this gets up to this position where we're actually ready to trace out some ribs. Before I actually cut the ribs and get rid, I want to make sure, go to the next step, I want to make sure this seam doesn't have any lumps in it. Yeah, I can see right here, this, when I'm laying this flat on the table, I don't want to have that little lump. I can just block sand out, just little lumps of glue. Because from this point on, I want this to lay perfectly flat on the table. If this doesn't lay flat, when you're installing the ribs, obviously, you can build a warp in it. And the beauty of this system is how simple it is to do this. You don't need any kind of jigging at all. You probably don't even need a really flat table. In, in the end, you could take it and ammoniaize it or whatever. But if you have that flat spot on a table, and I know mine is relatively true, Mike has the tombstone, or we could actually bring the tombstone over and do that. To get the bottom perfectly flat, then we're ready to put ribs in place. At the point we need 24 ribs, I need to measure the longest one. The longest one I'm going to need is going to be uh, 5 inches long. So there's a lot of ways to make these ribs. You could line them up with a with a uh, a ruler and cut them but it's a lot easier if you have a stripper just get a stripper set the stripper to three eighths of an inch this dimension here is three eighths of an inch strip them off five inches long and then we'll make a little jig to make the radius end on the front it will make all 24 of them in a matter of five minutes easy way to set the stripper obviously we'll check that we have we have not created a monster here, and this is exactly 3 8 Get the old stripper, and I can set it right on this piece of wood now. This is a master ass screw stripper. I'm sure you can get these from John Brodak or from any of the hobby shops. Lucky guess. Let's go one shorter. Now, one of the things I always do is cut a test piece just to make sure that we haven't altered that dimension in any way. I don't want to have this all puffed up, and I don't want to have it that I have to press it down. I want it to slide in and be a relatively nice, tight fit. Tip worth its weight in gold. When you're not using this guy, put a little block of wood over it. <laughs> you know how many times I've reached in the toolbox and wound up putting my fingernail underneath there? All right, we'll get some scrap 16 pieces at least five inches long and this this is the most important thing that I want to be sea grain I've saved the best piece of the hard sea grain for this for the ribs now this is all the pieces of scrap but it's the real nice dense grain sea grain now see how, how hard that grain is I can't even cut that piece off so that's a scrap piece let's see if we can get some of these it's a little bit of work to get the sea grain to strip just right. Obviously, you could buy 3 8 wood. This one looks okay. But real important that you don't try to use A-grain on this. You wind up using A-grain, boy, it's very likely it's going to twist in time. All right, I know we're going to need 24 pieces, 5 inches long to start with probably get them all out of that one piece too. Whenever you run into a piece of wood where the grain is just starting to split like that, just dump it. That's going to be a problem. That's going to want to that's going to want to split when you're when you have it installed. Now this whole piece is garbage. Okay, so we got enough. We could lay out the ribs now. Now, with obviously a circle guide or whatever, I can make up a little template. This will be my template for all the ribs. I'll leave it just a little bit. I'll leave half of the line on. And now I need to measure five inches. This is going to be the longest 
of the ribs that I need. It'll be five. I'll make them a little bit oversized because I'm going to trim them just like an I-beam wing. And with this in mind, then all I need to do is take the parts that I have over there, the, the strips of wood, and make up 23 more of them. Okay, looks like a bunch of lollipop sticks. Okay, we're ready to start putting the ribs in place. Easy way to do this, just to make sure, you can either do it with weights, or I do it with just taping it to the flat part of the table. You could also put weights on there if you like. Put some gorums on there or something. No matter how you do it, it doesn't matter. The idea is the tape or the weights or some other fixturing of choice. Just hold this in position, and one by one, we're just going to insert the ribs. As they're inserted, and just do kind of a little dummy job here. As a rib is inserted, I'll trim it off in the back before I glue it. You can see it's such a nice fit. Everything fits. You don't even need anything to hold it in position. And you can just figure, this is this is kind of the easy part. Let me get one rib in here. I'll see if President Nixon needs our help today. And obviously one of the things I can do as I go along here is just trim them. Actually, I ought to trim them before I put them in. Just make a little less work here when we go to put the trailing edge in. Before I put the three center ribs in, I want to put some grain top to bottom because it's in compression. What's going to happen to those three center ribs, they're going to want to get squashed and the grain going straight up and down will make that a lot stronger and add almost no weight at all. Some good news and then, believe it or not, and I, I'm not making this up, believe me. The, the phone call that we just had, that was Al Rabe. He just flew his bear cat, and he said it pulled his arm off. So, anyway, hey, boy, I hope we're going to get some video of that soon, flying at VSC. Anyway, the point here, I, I tack glued two four-inch pieces together. I need to lay out, and, of course, I'll put one on each side. So, in essence, this will be three-sixteenths wide when I'm done. May as well glue it right in place. There's no sense fooling around. I need to make three of these the grain going in that direction on both edges is going to add a tremendous amount of strength because all of this all the forces at the center of the stab are in compression they want to squeeze the stab together what I'll do is cut these out and then flip them over so that the, <clears throat> the the top to bottom grain is going to be on both outer sides and it'll be like almost like a piece of balsa plywood and now with the grain going in this direction get tremendous strength. A lot of times this is a thing that, over, that a lot of people overlook, I overlooked for a long time, is if you don't have the grain going in the right direction you really have to make the part itself heavier use more material to get the same amount of strength. When you get the grain going in the right direction an end grain balsa is one of, probably right up there with carbon fiber, one of the strongest materials you can even possibly hope to use end grain balsa and in essence that's what we're doing with this is making end grain balsa 
Now with these pieces, you see how nice that laminates up? All, this, all its strength in the right direction. Obviously I want to do a little dry fit. Trim these off. And we'll be ready to make up the top sheeting. And I want to make sure I have this right on the center. Don't you love how you always glue your hand to things? Okay, now with my fingers glued to the last part, we are ready now to make up the top sheeting. The top sheeting is basically going to be a replication of the bottom sheeting, except I make it oversized. So as I can push it up like a piece of sheetrock and keep trimming the, the hard spots, and get that nice fit right on that top edge. Yeah, I just look to see if I have picked up any any high spots. Not really. Looks like these are pretty even. I hardened up all the wood in the center here with just putting some thin CA down. It always seems like a little bit of oil gets in through the horn anyway. Now one quick way to get a, a relatively quick cut, it's relatively accurate, 2.2, 2. 2.2, 2. okay, so I can make two dots here, and this is just rough, and measure down on this side and on both sides, 2.2. 2. Then connect that dot to that dot, and the same as laying out the wing sheeting on a, uh, you know, on a cardinal or whatever. Gives you a good starting point for where that piece should be. So if you take this dimension and just move it down, in essence, that's how you can do it. Now, if it was a smaller dimension, another way to do it is get the two corners hard and just lay a ruler up here and take one piece out. Then once that piece is out, take another piece out. And eventually that piece will fit right in there with with no manipulation at all, just like fitting a piece of sheetrock. Okay, so I'm going to trim this piece. After a dry fit, you can see we're a little bit off here. Actually, it's not too bad. But you can see the edges are tight. This is loose, so what I need to do is just trace this back. But now I can follow that line. And I've watched a lot of people that seem to have, uh, you know, I don't know, a trouble figuring this out. And I used to be, I still am one of them. <laughs> anyway, I can take a little shaving like that off at the end. And after I block sand this edge off, I can just keep fitting it. And wherever there's a hard spot, I just keep dressing it off. And in cases like this, there's nothing better than that big sanding block. The bigger and longer the sanding block it is, Well, it looks like we have a reasonable fit here. Now, the next thing I want to do is run that glue seam. But first, I need to extend this piece back, oh, three-eighths of an inch or so. And I'll just laminate that back on to another piece. It's just easier to make this kind of a joint in one piece of wood than if we had the joint going up there. And obviously, it doesn't matter where the joint is. As long as the grain is in one piece, sea grain going tip to tip. The easiest thing is the same way, just tape the piece of wood together, flip it over, and run the joint. And if you do this kind of joint over the Teflon, or over wax paper, you almost always get a real nice joint. Trick, even if you're doing foam wing skins, is just get a little bit of dust in that groove. Have the wax paper, Teflon, or something that's not going to stick underneath. Just let that get in there. If we were doing a foam wing with wing skins, this is exactly what we would do. Try to run the seam in one shot. Now 
Wipe it with a Q-tip if you possibly can. If you have a friend, let him do it so you get this done quick. It's dry already. When I put this skin on, what I try to do is pick out the hard spot, which is right up here, and just tack it first. Get a little tack on it. Work my way down. Let's make sure that's in. Work down a little bit. Kind of line it up with the tip of your finger. Because now the back is still open, we're able to get in. I can pick this up off the table and drop some thin CA down on each one of the ribs. Lock the ribs in, and this guy should be well on the way to being finished. Now you just let the dust fill in any little gap that might still be there. And what I like to do is just do a legitimate run of the seam. And once we, once we pick this up and do the back, that locks this right into position. And the nice thing about this type of tail, and I would suggest anybody building a cardinal or a, some other design even, try one of these tails. Very easy to make. And they offer a lot of advantages. They usually come out extremely light and extremely straight and easy to set up the neutral on. Now, in an effort to keep the dust down, this is one way of doing it. And I always try to do this for Karen's sake, of course. Heck, for my own sake. Poor man's dust collection system. Now, once we take that tape off and take this off the table, lock in the ribs. Now before I take this tape off, what I need to do, see this sheet here can still be pulled up. I want to get in here, because what this will do is this locks it in. This is one of the key little tricks, is get it locked in before you take it off the table. That'll really tend to keep it from ever warping. Once that dries, we'll be able to take it right off the table. Now with the part completely off, I can run a glue seam on each one of the ribs, both sides. And this really locks it in. I mean, it's tacked in with the one drop. Once that glue sets up, this is really strong. See how nice that works. Okay, day one ends. I put a little bit of dap, spackle, whatever you want to call it in. A couple of spots that I had put my fingernail in in the course of the day. And tomorrow we'll come back and uh, put the trailing edge in. we got to make a horn. That's on a pain in the neck. And make up the other probably two or three more days, and we'll be uh, we'll be done and ready to paint it. Today, I always like to look. <clears throat> I like to do this this little dap thing, whenever I have a I had put my fingernail in this a few places, or along the joints. If you can't get the joints 
perfectly level. You don't want to make the wood so thin. I always like to let it dry overnight, even though it probably would dry a lot quicker if you uh, put it up by a heating vent or in, out in the sun. But I want to dress off all these little areas. This goes really quickly. <clears throat> and look down this, and you can see, boy, it doesn't get a lot straighter than that. It's relatively, relatively, it's really strong and nice and light. So the next thing, once this is all sanded out, the next thing I want to do, make up the trailing edge piece, and that'll get sandwiched inside. So in effect, you won't see the joint on the outside of the wood. Now I have the sandpaper glued to the table. I want to get a nice smooth edge on this. I want to get a nice straight edge for the wingtips. I love that sound. Anyway, it's it's starting to look like a tail here. I generally do is look for which side has the nicest smoothest grain marked out as the top obviously uh, you know you'd like the best side and both sides of this are relatively good though now what I want to do I want to lay out a piece of wood that's going to fit right in here as the trailing edge it'll be 3 8 in this dimension and a quarter inch in the other dimension I need to go look through the wood pile and see if I can find a real nice straight piece now, since we haven't reset the stripper, you would think there's a real good chance. Don't I wouldn't guarantee this. I'm going to look for the what looks like the, the nicest side of this wood. I could strip off a piece, and it would fit right into that groove. And boy, if there ever was a famous last words. Let's see may need to adjust the cutter well, that looks like it's going to be fine in fact it's a little oversized just what we want get an idea how nice that fits in there when that's pressed into position and just leave the stripper set you don't even have to reset it you can take this trailing edge piece before it's even installed mark where the notch is going to be for the horn obviously we're going to need a notch now I also want to lay out where the hinges are going to be there's going to be three hinges so I try to space them equally I can cut the hinge pockets before I even install this it's a lot easier to do it before it's installed lay out the three hinges relatively equally here mark the plan and see I've got a hinge lined up right where a rib is That'll make it just a bit stronger at no extra cost. Just leave this right on the plan. Three hinges on each elevator. Now I know from this drawing I could line up the center and I can mark where my hinges are going to go, where my hinge pockets are going to go. laid out where all the hinge pockets are going to be and because we're, it's easy to do this while it's in your hand you could set up that little fixture that we've used in the past or just put a hinge pocket right in your thumb no problem obviously I'm working off a center line Wherever a hinge pocket is on this side, I want to trans. See, I've got the, the piece sticking through, but I want to mark where it ends because I'm going to hollow this part out before I install it. Just scallop out some of that wood that's just going along for the ride. In this type of structure, the skin, the balsa skin, is going to carry all the weight, and all we need the ribs for and the trailing edges to hold the hinges in. This one's already done. Now I can take this material pretty much in between here and just scallop it out. I could mark this with my
Now just remember, if you want to know what the numbers are, anytime you can save a gram at the tail, you're usually saving 1.8 at the nose, or a total of almost three grains. Anything you can pull off the tail, you're really removing three times that amount of weight from the model. And whatever amount of weight we've removed, even if it's only a few grains, it's gonna triple by the time we get to the overall model weight. Okay, this really drops right in there beautifully now. Just make sure I'm on center. I got the center lines lined up. Now what I want to do is, again, I know you'll love this, tape this about every about where every hinge is and then glue the seam in between and then take off the tape. I can't run a glue seam because I want to put pressure on that and I want to have it nice and tight as I glue it. And usually if I don't do that, what I wind up doing is gluing my hand to the part. I know you've never done that. This allows it to stay nice and tight, and I don't need to glue the whole seam at once. I can just glue in between and take the tape off and then run the whole seam. I can just do one little area at a time. Work my way right down the whole part this way. Once that seam is dried, the question of just screwing it up on a sanding block. And I'll sand these corners flush. We'll be ready to make tips up real soon. But a tweener here, this was one of our first planes to have a flat tail. Of course, we have that on video many times. But we've gone back and forth with this Cardinal series of planes and flat tail to airfoil tail. Anyway, I've always liked that look with it. There's a lot of rake in the leading edge of the tail. And this was the first one I made with a flat tail and with 1967. Look at that hat. And with a lot of a lot of rake in a leading edge of the, the stab. I really right from the very beginning liked that look of that. Now I'm gonna just work on I'll make the tip block about a sixteenth of an inch oversized so I can do a final blend in, leave it hanging out over the back a little bit, and then I can dress it off this way. President Nixon making wingtips. Now what I'll do, I'll make a little pattern up, of course, but I want to make this oversized for sure. Always leave it over just a tad. And I'll cut two of them so I have a match pair. The next step is to just tack this in place. Just a few drops of glue. The easiest way to always do this, just don't try to cut it exactly on a line. Leave a little bit extra. I can just go over to the bench and rough out the wingtip. Just rough it out. I do this kind of an operation. I like to get a new XL blade and a knife rather than trying to use up a dull blade. Just any carving operation, if you don't start with a new blade. Now in roughing this out, it's always a good idea to make a little bit less of a radius than you need and do the final radius, block sand it in, because I want to get this radius to kind of match. We get the last little bit. Yeah, it's true. With I used to try to use up blades and resharpen them all night. Now I just use blades like they were water. <laughs> this is why I always 
like to have a little extra material, especially around a trailing edge. I don't want to true that up until I get the block put in place. If you true this up and then when it glues on, it's a little bit off. you got to ruin your whole hinge line to get it even. Okay, as soon as this is carved, I'm going to pop it off and then obviously hollow it out. Okay, now I want to mark this. I want to obviously leave some material at the back. Just use my finger to make a little hollow line. Remember that ratio of three to one, so you don't want to have any weight at the back. Uh, behind the flap hinge line, I don't like to have anything going along for the ride. I just, I could clean the rest of that up with a piece of sandpaper on a dowel. Any kind of an old stick with a dowel on it, it's always good to put a final, get the final little amount out of there. Now we can glue this back on permanently. Hold it in place with tape, tack it on. I like the tape a lot better than pins because the pins always seem to leave little holes that come through when the plane is out in the sun for the first couple of days. You see the pin holes come right back. Now we can do a final sand out on this. Once I take the tape off, I can hit the glue, run a glue seam around the whole edge. Then it's a question of truing up the back and then getting a blend in here, a perfect blend. Well, as good of a blend as we can get. Oh yeah, it's just a question now of repeating this whole regimen over on the other tip. And we'll be ready to start the elevators. Uh, the next step, I have to replace the horn that I made. That it's just too tight of a fit here. I'm gonna, I'll do that off camera. We've already made horns on this series of tapes, and then I'm going to lay out the elevators. But I want to have the horn in place on the back of the stab first, because that sets the edge of the elevators. Again, it's that sequence of things that helps you out. Now, aren't you glad I'm not doing open heart surgery, making these little calculations? Anyway, I just replaced the wire, put the same upright, brazed it on the other horn, ready to install that in the back of the, uh, the stab. I think I need to know now to set this up. Obviously, I got to make a notch for the horn. I need to know how far out my little groove has to go. I just want all the handy little use for the old poly rugs. Now I want to make sure the next step is going to be to lay out the little notch because half of the eighth inch wire or a portion of it anyway needs to sit, needs to run out to about there. Now I need to just cut a little notch in there. Now I need to sink into this just a little slot so the little horn keeper, the little tin can piece can go in there. Now notice I offset the horn just a little bit so that the push rod, which is bigger on one side than the other, can come around on the inside of the circle. That next step I'll just tack that in with some CA. I've already put a drop, or a drop of chain lube on each side so that this doesn't lock up with getting some CA in that groove. What I'm doing is laying in a couple little pieces of carbon reinforcement. 
right in this area here. And just brush one way until it goes off. There it is. And what I can do is wrap these right around. All right, once that glue dries, I'll just, yep, it's all dry already. Just lightly sand this down, put another coat of thick CA over that. Make sure the horn is nice and free. If, you, if you've ever had it happen, it's some of that CA wicks its way in. Oh, man. Hey, right, that's going to work well, I think. Okay, we're ready to lay out the elevators. Okay, with the horn installed, now now I need to lay out this sheet, and I'm going to try to make what I call a pinched edge in the back. But I'm going to lay out the sheet here. I'll make a little pattern up. Lay out the sheet oversize, because I, I'm going to have the horn installed in this rib right here, and then have a false block so I can blend that block right to the back of the body. But I can lay out all my rib stations, because again, I want to match the ribs so that as the dope shrinks, if you tend to see the ribs, they all line up. Now using this <clears throat> little pattern, I can cut out my elevators. And what I'll do is I'll trace down all of the rib stations. I need to obviously reinforce that one, but I can lay out the sheets with the rib stations on one side. Obviously another thing too, I'm going to use sea grain nothing but sea grain wood. Now if for instance you are making a tapered elevator where it's thinner at the tip than at the root you want the grain to be parallel to the trailing edge. In this case because it's a constant the grain is going to be parallel to both. But you never want to run the, the grain parallel to the hinge line and then have it stagger at the trailing edge. Very important that the grain on a flapper and elevator always follow the trailing edge. This is one real quick concept. If you try to, now we're going to build this elevator flat on a table. But if you build a taper elevator flat on a table, what happens, it guarantees that you're going to have a warp. No matter how you do it, that trailing edge, when you're building on a flat table, you need to block up the trailing edge. I don't know, I'm sure I'm not explaining this the way it should be, but you really, the only elevator or flap that you can make on a flat table is one with no taper. Picture a Vico Chief Wing, you could build it flat on a table. Anything that has a taper, what's going to happen as it gets bigger and bigger, the one side's going to twist up. Very important that you not try to make a taper elevator or flap on a flat table the way we're making it. This is only appropriate when you're using, and we're, we're on purpose on this plane. Now the reason I made this because we're hoping we're going to get some Nomex and be able to make a Nomex tail. And a Nomex tail would be a flat tail, of course, but it, I want to make in a flat fixture. I don't want to make a curved fixture. So this will allow me to test Nomex when I get to that point. In the meantime, I'll have this tail. It only takes a couple days to make one of these. From our pattern, of course, and I went carefully through the wood to get the most sea grain of all the wood that I had. Now, I need to lay this part out by the horn, because what's going to happen is, it's going to be very, very delicate here, is I need to mark off where this is going to end. This is going to be the last rib, is going to be right there. So it's right there, because I'm going to make my edge that's going to have the containment for the horn, and I'll have the block out on the tip. And now I can just slide this back. The thickness that will be, 3 8 will be the leading edge. And obviously the next step is to make up four of these exactly the same. And I can get the rib locations on two of them. I have all four of the pieces cut out. Next step is going to be, we're going to want to get a rib down each one. And I can use a 90 degree triangle or a T-square, either one. Just This will just set my rib locations and I need to do this to two of them. 
Okay, now using a T-square, I just need to mark where my ribs are going to be because I'm going to actually lay these out on the bottom skins while the skins are attached flat to the table. Pretty much the same as we did the, the stab. In a non-tapered surface like this, it's very, very easy to make. Again, one of the things we'll be able to compare when we get our Nomex is that Nomex tail versus this type of tail. And we're still hoping we're going to be able to get a foam tail that'll have an airfoil in it. And then we'll have, we can have a real test then because this is a take apart plane. You don't have to take anybody's word for anything, which is always the way I like to do it. Anyway, butt these up so I get both of them exactly the same, which of course is one of the goals. I wouldn't want to have one elevator thicker or longer or wider. Or I'd like to have exact mirror images on all of these flying surfaces. And I can just go back, same thing, and retrace all the lines on this. Next step is going to be to figure out our rib sizes. Now we know the rib is going to taper to almost nothing here and to three-eighths of an inch up here. Now, all we need to do is figure one rib, every rib will be the same, with this dimension here, three-eighths, and tapering down to nothing. And obviously then we just make up all the ribs the same. The same as we did on a stab, there'll be no tapering. Every one should be exactly the same. All we need to know is that this is going to go down to zero. So we can have this right in the center. Actually, we can do it this way. Just make it a little bit oversized and then trim the 90 degrees at the front. Because we know each rib will be exactly the same length. And I'll just have to adjust my 90 degrees up in the front. Again, I'm using C grain 16. And then we'll trim that 90 at the front. Now I just want to see what this is going to lay in the way I want it to. Okay, now I just need to figure out how many of these I need. Okay, we're about ready to start laying up one of the elevators. The idea here is I, I'm on a piece of Teflon on the flat part of the table. I'll just take each rib one at a time. I want to leave it just hanging out just a little bit so I can have a little material to block sand down when I'm done if I need to. Just very little. You think I would never drop anything at this point in my life? <laughs> you think I'm not a basketball player? Anyway, I just got a great little thing in the mail today. I thought I'd share with you. Larry Shoemaker sent me a a set of collector airplanes similar to the ones Gerald Champ sent and Sleepy Ken Dawson and we're building up a collection of stuff up in that Spitfire bedroom that's pretty unbelievable. And we're having, we're, uh, the, the bottom line is we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I know Elliot's due to be here soon. And he's bringing his military pajamas, I guess, is the right word. Okay, now see, this one sticks off just a little bit more, but it doesn't matter. We're going to block Sandy's in. And you can pretty much figure out, we're just going to repeat that over and over and over on both elevators. What I do is, of course, trim off the back. There's probably, yeah, it needs a little more trim in the front. Get them kind of level. Now what I want to do is level that side off. I bet you're thinking, wow, he's a pretty creative guy. Well, then how come I'm not rich? Ask yourself, ask yourself that question. Love that sound. Anyway, I was looking at those little models from Larry Shoemaker. I'll put it on a video later. We'll, we're going to go add that to the Spitfire bedroom.
Oh, President Nixon. Anyway, look. One is done. Okay, what I do, I always put a piece of tape in place, make sure it's perfectly straight in both dimensions. Then tack in between the tape and take the tape off and run the glue seam. And once that glue seam is done, I can get inside and drip it down on each rib area. Now once the ribs are glued in place, this gets real strong. Now see, you can still pull this apart. So I'll start at one end. Make sure one kicks off before I go to the next one. You can pretty much figure that out. See, the nice thing about this type of construction is you get all the, all the seams inside done before you put the cap on the end. And now it's just a question of, we're going to run out of time tonight, so we'll probably have to finish this tomorrow. But relatively simple and perfectly straight, nice and rigid. And the main thing, very, very easy to build. I managed to get both elevators done. Tomorrow we'll work on the two tips, the two horn pockets, and the hinging. And we should be able to finish this in the third session. This morning before I get started, this is from Larry Shoemaker, I think I mentioned this yesterday. And I'll tell you, these are absolutely beautiful. We already have a Spitfire, now we're, we're going to have a whole slew of Spitfires here. Look at these. Unbelievable. Larry, you're okay. I don't care what Joe Ortiz says about you. Look at this. Little Al Rabe Mustang. These are great. See, people think all you want to do is go fly control line stunt baloney. That Spitfire bedroom is a big part of uh, <laughs> what I enjoy. Look at the prop even turns. Anyway, we're going to go put these. I'm going to take these out of the boxes. Go put these up in our Spitfire bedroom on display permanently. These are really cool. Really nicely detailed, too. If you're going to collect something, it may as well be something you really enjoy. Larry, these are great. I really appreciate it. Really cool. We're going to put these up on display. That Mustang is really nice. Larry, these things just fit right up in my bedroom. <laughs> a perfect match here in a Spitfire bedroom. And obviously, Larry, if you ever come to stay with us, we'll uh, deduct $100 off the bed and breakfast fee for staying in a Spitfire bedroom. Oh, golly. We got a couple more Army helmets. We got some more stuff. We got stuff from Warren Walker I haven't even put up yet. But these really are cool. I have that great Mustang that Gerald Champ gave me. This thing has retractable gear, believe it or not. Everything moves. Unbelievable. Larry, thank you so much. Back down to shop. Let's get some work done. See, I never knew when I actually made this bedroom. I never knew that that I was going to enjoy having these models on display. Most of the time you just think, oh well, they're, you know, they're at the flying field and that's the end of the enjoyment. Boy, I have just enjoyed the heck out of just having these up here, bringing people up here, letting people sleep here, having guests over, having Elliot stay over, other people that have enjoyed the, uh, the thrill of staying in this. I don't know how to even describe it. <laughs> I don't know that there's... <laughs> You know, there isn't 10 other Spitfire bedrooms somewhere in the world, but maybe this is the only one. I don't know. Anyway, we're getting back to work on that tail. we got to finish that today. Now, as our collection of moles grows on a daily basis here, 
One of the things we found out is very difficult to buy this Nomex. <laughs> but we're, in addition to this, the video of building this tail, we for sure very soon, I hope sooner than never, we're going to have a, a video on making a Nomex tail. And that's something I think will be, and got Gerald Shamps P51 to finish here. Jer, love this plane. Everybody that's over here thinks I built it. I'm taking full credit for it too. Okay, the next thing I need to do here is put the leading edges on this. Obviously we uh, we need to get a piece of this is going to be 3 8 by half. Cap this off. I'll look for a nice straight piece too. Boy, these come out nice. Anyway, make up the cap. Leave it oversized on the side that's going to go toward the horn by just a little bit. Now, obviously, I need two of these. Just trace that part out. Cut it out on the saw. Okay, next thing I want to do is just tack glue these in place. Not a permanent joint, just a tack glue. As I put the tape on, one thing I want to check is that Obviously that I have a real nice fit on the glue joint because this is going to show in the sun once this goes out in the sun. So what I try to do is just tape the part in place, make sure I don't have any gap in it that's going to have to be filled with glue. The same technique I use on the other parts, just tack glue this. I don't want this on permanently. The next thing is going to be to get a nice straight edge on both of these edges. Just go over to the sanding table, get these edges so that they're perfectly true from this edge out. This is one of the things that if you have a master ass screw or one of the other planes, I had this great plane that John Pothier turned me on to. Somebody borrowed it and didn't give it back, which is very common around here. But of course, I have other people's stuff, so I guess it works out. Wish they'd leave their wallet here. Anyway, we just want to get a couple of final cuts. Always try to hold a plane, if possible, on a little bit of an angle. That's a good trick. The plane always cuts better. It seems to cut better in balsa wood if you hold it on an angle. But you want to get the last few little cuts. Now, actually, the, the width of the blade holds that right in place so you don't gouge too much. Blade on an angle. See, if you're cutting this way, it's real difficult. You cut on an angle, you can even take a little bit of the last little bit of material off here. Between the plane and the long blade, you almost don't have to sand it. Boy, it doesn't take much with a sanding block to true that right up. If I want to get a center line on everything, and obviously you could use two pieces of tape. Obviously you could use a pen that writes. Warren Walker sent me all these great pens. Warren, they did work <laughs> for about a week. Do I wear things out in this shop that don't wear out in the real world? The thing is to lay out the angle cut. And what I do, because this is 3 8 by half, quarter inch is just about right to give me a 45 degree angle here. I lay out a piece of that tape and a piece of green masking tape. And I can take this piece of tape off repeat this on the other side. By using that angle and coming right up to the line, I want to come up to the line, knife on a 45 degree angle, take a little bit of material at a time. You obviously, the thinner slices you can take on an angle cut, the more accurate it'll be. You won't go oop, and dive into the material. 
goes without saying this is a good spot for one of those brand new XL blades not one that you use to uh, saw cement blocks with or pile a bathroom with or something you could obviously do it with a plane and the last little bit I have to do with a sanding block now I want to be careful I don't get up on I don't start wearing the tape away and you can actually feel when you hit the tape and you don't want to see that line disappear I want to leave enough there I'm using that center line as a reference to line up my hinge pockets okay now obviously half of this is done we can just go back repeat steps <laughs> nine to <through> ten <laughs> funny story I'm helping my son move the last couple of days he's moving to a new apartment and he goes out and buys this nine foot high by six foot wide baker's rack and I said, do I went over there to help him move it. This is a true story. Go over there. And I said, where's the baker's rack? So oh, you got to assemble it. It's in the si a box the size of a shoe box. There's 8,000 screws, 8,000 little Allen bolts and wood screws and everything. <laughs> and, and the directions are, you know, assemble it. And it just says, go back and repeat steps 9 through 2 million. True story. How they can make this cheesy furniture that goes together with, oh. I'll tell you, it was good to get it done. Believe me, that's a true story with that. All this take apart furniture. Jeez, unbelievable. Okay, all steps have been repeated. We need to just sink in, just rough out where the hinge pockets are here. Now, I need to just lay this part out. It's going to be right up against the horn. We put the tube in and mark where the hinge pockets will go. I'll just set them in with a parting wheel of course I got the hinge pockets just roughed in and what I'm going to do over each hinge pocket just simply take a piece of tape so I have some idea because obviously what I'm going to do is hollow this out but I want to know I don't want to hollow out the material around the hinge pockets now, a lot of these little hollowing operations, you know, you think, oh, I'm saving two grams, one gram, or whatever. You may multiply it by three, and that's the total weight. And a lot of times, you can save a significant amount. And the heavier wood you use, the more you can save. If you have punk three-pound wood, yeah, obviously, you don't save that much. But now, I can do the same thing here. I want to leave a little extra material. A lot of people find this to be uh, unnecessary. Well, that's okay, too. I want to mark this up in the same way I hollowed out the leading edge. Get the little wizard going. Get some of that extra material out of there. one of those things where you want to just take a little bit of material at a time and like I said the worse the, the the worse the wood is the better this will yeah, you know, you, in, in theory, if you had even 12-pound wood, if you remove enough of it. And if you do this and have light wood, wow. Now, I always like to take the last little bit out with a little dowel with some sandpaper on the end, get the hairs off of there. But even little, little details like that, they all add up. If you have a little piece of tubing or a dowel, you can sand the rest, that last little bit. See, the trouble with all these lightning little things is 
After you build a plane and it's heavier than you want it to be, you can't go back and do this. If you do this ahead of time, it's like putting money in the bank for your old age. If you hit the lottery, great. You have extra money, you can go buy some more uh, tune pipes or something. But if you don't have the money, oh, geez. And then you had your whole youth, you spent it all, well, you can't go back and undo it. That's the problem. The problem with all of this stuff. There's many planes that I would love to, once they're done and I've flown them and trimmed them, if I could somehow take them apart and go back in there and scallop out all the extra wood, Oh, man. But, unfortunately, there's a reality check to everything. Okay, that's ready to install back in. And, obviously, repeat steps for the 28 and uh, <laughs> put another baker's rack together. Stolen this. Here's a good little tip. Just tack it. Yeah, Q-tip. Just tack it every maybe six inches or so. I'm just holding it. Then take a sanding block. This is a good tip no matter when you're making a final joint that you want the joint to be seamless in the finish. It doesn't matter what kind of finish you're using. The seams always seem to want to come through. Now just by tacking it like that, and that's, that's part of it. Now what I want to do, let that kick off. Now I want to just very carefully run a sanding block or piece of sandpaper up on there and what this is doing is any little imperfection in that joint or groove it's filling with sawdust this is such a good tip this is one worth its weight in baker's racks oh that's a true story with that baker's rack and now what I want to do I want to just run the seam all at once Now, there's some people that I've had in the shop here that they, a little thing like just wiping these joints with Q-tips. They were getting these big globby, I don't even know what you could call them, it looked like icicles and popcorn and, well, when you do the Q-tip thing, that joint, see the sawdust actually kicks, acts as a very slow kicker, and never use kicker on these joints. I get all my CA from John Brodak and it's always nice and fresh. I don't have to deal with gallons and gallons of kicker. And that's a joint that should, in theory at least, not come out in the, you know, after that's doped and tissued and everything. Okay, now obviously we'll repeat steps 48 to 72 and uh, on the other elevator. The next step, I just took the, uh, the little wizard and put a little notch in there so I can set the horn in place. Now, one of the things that I do is I set the tube in right while the stab is in place. In other words, I use the stab itself to be the fixture that sets this, because if this angle is off even just by one degree, if you take this off and just glue a tube in here, a lot of times you go to put the elevator on, it's like that, it's like, yeah, it's something crazy. This way I've picked up that exact angle, and of course I've checked it that it's 90, but even so, wire has a memory it could go back a degree or two I want to use that as the fixture so I want to cut a piece of aluminum tubing next get it all set to tack in place and tack it in place before I do anything else remember what I'm trying to accomplish is once that tube is set in place I place this on here then I then and only then will I try to well first off I may have to trim an eighth of an inch or so but I can make up my block. Now many times what I've tried to do is make the block up, get this all fared in, then I go to put it on the horn and it's like that. Oh, geez. So I like to work from, from this point out and if you follow the sequence that I'm outlining on the tapes, there's really no lost effort here. Get this set, that sets the angle out here, then we can trim this, get our block on there and hollow it out. Yeah, the first step. This is the hobby shop tubing. K&S tubing, I think, is the right word. I want to slide a piece on there. I want to leave it just a little bit longer than the horn. Of course, it's not going to go all the way up to the leading edge. Now, what I want to do is... I want to put this in position. I got to deburr this edge, of course. Now 
Okay, now that sets that in position. That's exactly where I want that to be. Now when I take the elevator, you know, long elevator, I may have to make that notch a little bigger. Okay, that sets it right in position and I can line up, line up 90 degrees, line up that I have it in the center right about there, and just tack it in place. Now I always use thick here because if you put a drop of thin here, I guarantee this is just attack it in position. What I guarantee is going to happen is you're going to go to take the elevator off. The CA has wicked in. Just like on those little horn bushings, you can destroy a whole tail without even realizing why. Okay, now once I have that, that's tacked in place. In fact, I didn't tack it well enough. No, not well enough. That is a good lesson for you. What I need to do is get back in there. See, I try to do this with as little glue as possible. Obviously, that doesn't always work. <laughs> because I want to be able to cut this away if it's if something's twisted or crooked. Okay, with that tacked in position, now what I want to do is get some end grain balsa in here. This because this is a little bit bigger than eighth inch three. If you have some three sixteenths, or you can take some quarter inch and shave it down. But I want it in grain. I want it in grain. I don't want to just try to lay in a piece of wood here. In grain balsa. Because I have plenty of sixteenth sea grain and it's nice light stuff. I want, I'll just do it in three pieces of sixteenth and then come back down and dress it off. I'm letting it go just a little bit past the horn. I don't want to get it stuck up in the horn and get glue in it. You want, you want to try to avoid getting glue in there if possible. But the whole trick here is to have it end grain if you want this to be bulletproof. Let's do it in three three little shim parts. Just lose up I'm just using up the little scrap left over from what I made up. You can see the ribs were cut out of this piece. After the third piece, you can see we're just a little bit on the plus side here, so I can trim all these off and then just repeat hey, put that baker's record. Just repeat the same thing on the other side. But having this all a grain, I've made these out of plywood, light ply. It's always heavier. This is the light way to make it. And believe me, this is the strong way. You're going to break that horn through some end grain ball, so you have to really do something to fly into a baker's rack or something. That right there, that's the whole tip to success is that end grain. Now, obviously, I'll repeat the same thing on this side, and then we'll just fill in the back piece with a piece of scrap. And this is one of the things that whenever you see somebody with the horns breaking out, and there's all kind of other inventions to make it work. This way, I guarantee you, you will not be breaking horns out. Of course, my guarantee is... Uh, only applies if you send me your paycheck every week. Just stress this off with a sanding block. And you can see how nice that confines that. Totally confined in in grain balsa. Now I need to trim this off, of course, and then get my little scrap block back here. Any little scrap here, we just happen to have a piece that's just about the right size. Now I can carve this, get this perfectly parallel, and then I need to make up a little scrap piece, and I don't know what that size is yet that's going to fit as a little fairing, because this plane won't have fairings up on the body. It'll just have a little piece glued to the edge here. And by the way, it doesn't matter how far in you set the horn, you can always just make a block here. We can't really figure out that piece of block till we have the other elevator and we have the tail sitting in place. But that is just about the best way I've found and, and that I can pass on to you. And I hope that works well. I'm sure, I don't hope it will work for you.
Overconfident, that's my name. Get the baker's rack and just repeat all steps A and step B. Steps 2068 to 751. Tip that's worth its weight in gold. If and and of course in the course of doing this, you always wind up getting a little a little CA in there. Well, I went to push this onto the horn and it doesn't want to go. In the past, what I've done is go over to the drill press, put it on no speed, and just turn the chuck. Well, that's one way of doing it. But an even better way, I think you have better control. Is I have a little tap handle, and obviously uh, you know, a couple dollar tool, but I can go in there. And the slower you can go, the better. I don't want to drill out the back of the part. And I don't want to make a lot of extra clearance, but you can feel I've got a little bit of CA in there. And now the horn, never put it in a drill press and then hit the switch, or you'll you'll be eaten apart. Be time to make another tail. Yeah, that I've destroyed a lot of tails, putting it in drill presses and then turning the, turn the switch on. Now what I want to do now is... When I line up the other tube, what I'll try to do is get a little piece of scrap balsa over here, similar to that. Any thickness, it doesn't matter, because that's going to line me up for this side. Pretty slick, huh? You know, once that, that lines up that the two elevators are exactly the same, or very close, assuming you keep it on the... In fact, you know what I do is put a piece of tape here. This is a little flimsy. The king of fixtures here. And this can this can hold it in position. And now I can just get a drop of thick CA on here. Yeah, that baker's rack. Well, I'm thinking about it all day today. What a pain. When you get a big giant piece of furniture the size of a Kenworth truck in a shoebox, you know there's a lot of us. It's like that grill. I bought a outdoor grill. And look, the thing comes in a box, you know, like the size of a Nobler kit. I thought, what the hell is this? Before I go any further, I want to see that those two elevators are, are in pretty good alignment. And then I can do the final glue. And I'll make that shim up there. Just use a little piece of tape to hold them in alignment in the back. The thing I want to do is I want to lay out these two little blocks. And I'm going to make these pretty oversized, in fact. And just tack glue them in place here. Because, of course, I have to make the hold downs on the tail and everything. And I want to leave a little extra material here. But I'll just get a nice soft piece of half inch and make that block. Just rough it out. I made these little pieces out of scrap. I haven't even hollowed them out yet. I made them plenty oversized because I want to get the final shape when I actually set the tail into the fuselage and I'll be able to shave and cut and, and peel some of that away at the same time. And then hopefully I'll just pop them off. They're only tack glued in place and then hollow them out also. Obviously, the blocks are still oversized, but now that I have that part finalized, and I'll do the finalize the final fit on those when I go to mount this in with the take apart linkage that has to bolts and things that have to go on it. What I want to do now is lay out a piece of scrap a little bit oversized for my the second half of my tip. Now, see, this is where it really it really is easy now because we have a, this this can't slide back and forth. So I can leave it right in position. I can tape this together, which is always a good idea. While it's taped together, then I can lay out this block right here, and I'll have plenty of material to work with. I can get the angle and everything right. I always leave the last thing as the tip blending in the flap or the elevator. And always good to leave it a little bit oversized to begin with. And next step, I'll blend this in. I have it tacked in place, then pull it apart and just pull a little bit of that out. Just hollow it out. Don't want to make it paper thin because I want to be able to dress all the edges off, get all my final shapes. I like to just rough carve these things in and then actually mount this to the other piece and then follow the contour of 
the stab to get that final little cut because that cut there has to be well not, oh man president nixon is on my case today you would think a guy that was dead wouldn't make this many phone calls you can see i've intentionally made this oversize by an amount and now what i'll do is i'll go over to the sanding bench and real carefully work this angle in i don't want to do it over here in fact i can even trim some of this away so I always try to trim instead of sanding whenever possible because I don't want to make the dust. I can get that off and do the rest over by the sanding bench. And then I want to blend these tips in. That's, that's the key thing here is that when this is sitting stationary, I don't want to have a step out or a step in. I want to have this edge here real accurate. That really does, when that, when that, when that edge isn't right, wadada, 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 sounds like a banana here. When that's not right, now in this location, I can just blend that whole thing down. I have the two surfaces taped together. I can work that whole edge all at once. Again, I like to get it right over the bench if possible. This is one way, just one of many ways of getting nice, true edges and once I get the edges then I'll harden them up with thin CA so they're a little less prone to take a whack take a ding step is just repeat everything steps 2083 to 321 Ugh. I'm going to call you all day so you can never get this model finished there's a rare picture of me shaking hands with President Nixon. Yeah, the only thing left to do is set the hinge pockets. And since this is a take-apart plane, I need to make that little adjustment where the two elevators meet in the back. That's going to be crucial. And I need to do it for both of the fuselages, of course. I need to also install, and it looks like we're not going to have time to do it on this tape. I need to do the hold downs. I'm going to do them similar to Kaz and Paul and... The, the typical way that I guess, I don't know who gets the credit for the, the invention, but it's it's a common way they do it with the three bolts. And I guess I'll have to carry some of that through on the next tape. And of course the finishing. And we're ready to start putting trim on a plane soon. This is the last of the things. And we are ready. Now at the end of doing this, the last thing, the last thing I need to do is just get a rough weight. This is not real critical. We're at uh, a little 52.1 at this point in time. And I'd say that's about average for what the 52, a little under two ounces for a 60 tail is good in raw wood. And I hope some of these tips you've been able to use to make a, a real nice light. Even on a Noble you could use this construction. Nothing tricky here. Again, we started with these pictures and we're going to end with them. No matter which way you make a tail, there's a lot of good ways. Certainly a lot of different ways. This is one way that's worked for me. I think it's very similar to the way Paul Walker and Kaz make a tail for a take-apart plane. Billy Wurwich makes the kind of a semi-triangle tail, sheet tails. I mean, there's just, there's just a world of different ways to do it, and I hope you've picked up some of the technology from this tape, gotten some good ideas, gotten some inspiration. Series to the Miss Ashley tapes, and I hope you'll pass them around, share them with your friends, enjoy them learn from them, and then pass that information on to other people. I hope the Miss Ashley project is going to break some new ground. We've certainly tried a lot of innovative things on this airplane. Don't know which ones of them are going to pan out. But we do have a full carbon fiber fuselage in primer ready for the next day. Probably tomorrow if the weather breaks. It's been raining for a couple of days. If the weather breaks, we're going to start getting trim on a plane, start making up the trim patterns. And again, I hope there's little things. Sometimes there's just little stuff you can pick up off a of tape. I think the biggest thing you can pick up is just 
have fun, have a great time with the hobby, no matter which level, skill level you compete at, no matter which plane, which mode you decide to use. Hey, there's very few things in the world that are going to wind up being more fun than this. And if there is, I haven't found them. And again, I just love these Reno Air Racers. Boy, if, if I had my dream come true, it would be to <laughs> get some free tickets to Reno from Paul Winter. I don't think it's going to happen, though. Anyway. Anytime you break new ground, you know it's just going to be, there's going to be a level of a learning in the beginning. Difficult learning curve. Something we're willing to put up with. Maybe a year or two of not having good success, but I'm sure eventually we will. Got three of these fuselages ready. One of them's going to England, two are going to stay here, so we hope by, well, by the end of this year we have some real good stuff to write about in stunt news and stuff to videotape. Just one final note before we close out the tape. For all the people that have purchased Cardinal kits and would like to make this type of a tail, using the outline of the that's on the Cardinal plans, it's a very practical way. Mike Kajeski's done two of them already. I've done several. The flat tail, and I would probably attribute Paul Walker to uh, getting most of the credit for making it a popular option. It's certainly, it's certainly, this is one good way to make yourself a nice super light tail in a very, we did this in three days. Three evening sessions of about four hours each. Got about 12 hours into this, maybe 13, and videotaped it at the same time. So in the meantime, means you probably could do it on uh, one Saturday if you had a whole Saturday and you didn't, you didn't eat or, <laughs> or whatever thing we're going to do starting on the next tape we're going to start the Brodak dope finish for this year the trim the ink line special lettering Bob Brookins is sending us some of the first Brodak gold to use a lot of we have the Miss Ashley red in stock the purple the yellow the ag cat yellow a lot of the wild colors that are going to be coming out in the next year and again a special thanks to John Brodak for making this product available without his help would be a lot of it. In fact, I'll quote Paul Walker exactly. Makes me want to build again. And we'll see you on the next tape. And special thanks here to Kaz and to Paul for sharing some of their uh, technology of the take apart airplanes. And I hope we're going to be able to make this work and be able to pass it on. Thanks to both of you guys. See you on the next tape. Brodak Dope Finishing coming up. Mm, John Pothier has already been downloading some of these uh, lettering designs, the 38s, the Miss Ashley lettering. All that stuff's going to be coming up on the next couple of videos.